Good morning. Once again, we come to the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to be in chapter 9, verses 13 through 18. We started this series quite a while ago, the subtitle of it being, When Life Doesn't Make Sense. And certainly, uh, when we look around us, it seems more and more that we just can't make sense of things that are going on around us. Uh, the preacher wrote uh, when he was writing the book that life didn't make sense then. It certainly hasn't changed much, has it, over the years. And so we want to start by uh, reading Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 13 through 18. It says this, I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with a few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building a great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. In this passage, we are, uh, we are introduced to what I would like to call the power of one. The power of one. Uh, there is the poor man who is able to save a small city with only a few men in it from the attack of a great and a powerful king. That is the power of one being put to good use. On the other hand, we have the one sinner who through the power of one destroys that which is good. So like the preacher, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here today on the negative aspect of the power of one. Uh, I think it is helpful for us to reflect for a moment on how one sinner uh, can destroy much good. Uh, despite our claims to the contrary, the effects of our sin are almost never confined to the person who commits the sin. Uh, that is why both Jesus and the Apostle Paul often pictured sin uh, as being like yeast. Now, I'm not a baker. My wife is. Uh, whenever you make bread, it takes just a little bit of yeast mixed into the dough to cause the entire batch of dough to rise. And since we all live within uh, several different communities, when we sin, uh, the effects of that sin spread within our families, our neighborhoods, our workplace, our churches, uh, wherever we find ourselves. It it's kind of brings to mind the principle of the yeast. You know, there is a clear biblical example of this, and it is found in the life of David and Bathsheba. When David looked down from his rooftop one evening, uh, he lusted after Bathsheba. Uh, he set into motion a series of events which continue to have a tremendous impact on our world today. Uh, we see that Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, was set up to be killed on the battlefield. The child conceived from that illicit affair died. David's family, we read, uh, became completely dysfunctional. His son Ammon raped his sister and then was killed by his brother Absalom. And then his own son, Absalom, rebelled against him and tried to take over the kingdom. After his son Solomon died, the conflict within the family was so great that it led to the splitting of Israel into the southern and the northern kingdoms. They have still not been reunited to this day. And so also, although the effects of sin uh, may not always be widespread, uh, we have adequate evidence uh, that we find in Scripture, that we find within our own experiences, that recognize that our sin, just one sin, can have far-ranging consequences. 
And that knowledge should hopefully, uh, for us, uh, should be a strong deterrent when we are tempted to commit some sin uh, that is in our lives. The greater part of this passage, however, deals with the positive aspect of the power of one. So I want to take a few minutes and reflect on what it is. How do we use uh, the power of one for good? Uh, this passage ought to be a great encouragement to all of us who ask ourselves, what can just one person do? Have you ever thought that? I am just one voice, or I am just one set of hands in a place where there are so many needs. How can I possibly make an impact? Well, uh, I do believe that we can. And we see the principle here, uh, one poor man in a small town the man isn't named, the town isn't named. We don't know who it was or where he was, but was able to use the power of one to thwart the attack of a great and a mighty king. Not surprisingly, uh, many commentators, many theologians, uh, uh, many preachers, uh, as they comment on this passage, they tend to spiritualize it uh, and view it as an allegory where uh, Satan is the great king, and the poor wise man is Jesus. I'm not sure that we can make that leap. I don't think scripture shows us that. As we take this text and we look at it at face value, uh, based on a plain reading of this text, the author seems to focus on the practical value of wisdom and not the epic battle between good and evil. He's highlighting how important wisdom is. He's highlighting the importance of having wisdom, of utilizing wisdom, of putting it to good use. You know, we've seen throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, there is a limit, isn't there, on the value of wisdom. Our wisdom, for example, will never, ever uh, be adequate for us to figure out God. Wisdom isn't a guarantee of any kind of personal profit, uh, personal gain, or advantage in any way. Uh, um, it is not an advantage for us as we, um, as we live our lives day by day. But as the preacher has pointed out, wisdom is certainly better than folly. Uh, but in this section, we find some additional observations about wisdom. Uh, it will allow us to use the power of one for good. So the first point is this, as we, as we take a broad view of this text here this morning, uh, power comes from wisdom and not from strength. Uh, this is such an important principle. The preacher uses it twice uh, just in this very short passage. In verse 15, he says, wisdom is better than strength. In verse 18, he says, wisdom is better uh, than weapons of war. You know what? That certainly flies in the face of the idea that might is right and that uh, uh, the survival of the fittest is, is a thing. Uh, the scripture doesn't teach that, by the way, and here we see uh, wisdom is better than might. It is true that strength and might may prevail in the short run, uh, but wisdom is much more profitable in the long run. The world that we live in uh, certainly focuses on the power and the strength and the might uh, it focuses on those that perhaps have the loudest voices, but yet uh, uh, there is a warning that is associated here. The words of the wise spoken quietly should be heard rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. You know, back in 2009, uh, Time Magazine released the results of an online poll of the world's 100 most influential people. Do you remember who was at the top of the poll? The poll was topped by someone named Moot. Moot 
It turned out that Moot was a 21-year-old college dropout, also known as Christopher Poole. He hacked into the Times computer and rigged the top 21 positions in the poll so that the first letter of each person's first name spelled out a rather cryptic message. Moot was at the top of the list because technology-wise, at least, he had the loudest voice. But even without the antics of Moot and his fellow pranksters, the list is populated with those who are hardest to ignore. Politicians, actors, entertainers, athletes. You know, if we are not careful, even those of us, Christ followers, can get caught up into listening to the shouts of these fools. And let me just say, especially in this season right now, uh, the election right around the corner, just a, a few short days from now, everybody is, is jockeying for position to let their voice be heard the loudest. Uh, and a lot of people are listening to them. Uh, I would encourage you, uh, in, instead of listening to them, uh, pray, pray, do your research, pray some more. So even when it comes to teaching the scriptures, uh, we have a tendency to listen to those with the loudest voices, don't we? Uh, the ones with the largest churches, those who are prolific authors and have written uh, the most books, uh, the ones that have big radio programs. I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to them. Uh, I'm saying that make sure that as we are listening to them, that we are growing and that we are listening to them for the right reason. The loudest voice does not always carry the best theology. And so we need to be very careful, I think, in who we listen to. The preacher here leaves no doubt that wisdom is superior to strength, uh, to power, and to might. But uh, as we will see here, it's not just any wisdom uh, that comes into play here. We need to define exactly what he means by wisdom in this passage. Words mean things. And so we want to go ahead and make sure that we understand the terms. No definition that we find in any dictionary is going to be adequate. However, uh, I'm very thankful. Uh, the Bible clearly defines the kind of wisdom that the preacher uh, is writing about here in Ecclesiastes. Uh, in James chapter 3, verse 13, uh, we have the great passage on wisdom. And it says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and self, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. It's interesting how well uh, this fits with our passage here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. You see, worldly wisdom is loud and is self-serving. It results in destruction. It results in dis, uh, disunity. It results in decay. Heavenly wisdom, the kind that we need to seek, is the exact opposite of that. It involves humility. It is quiet. It is peaceable. And that is the only kind of wisdom that results ultimately in good. You see, one voice can speak with wisdom. Verse 17, 
says this, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. There is only one voice that speaks the word of the wise, and that is the voice of God. But God, unlike the fools of this world, does not usually shout out his wisdom, does he? Instead, he invites us to come quietly into his presence and to listen to him as he speaks to us. Most of us are probably very familiar with the account of Elijah. Uh, God invited him up to the mountain to experience the presence of God. But let us return there again uh, for just a moment. First Kings chapter 19 says this, And he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? You see, God was not in the wind. Uh, he was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire. Instead, his voice was an auditory voice. It was the voice of God. And Elijah had to quiet himself and listen very, very carefully. You know what? I think uh, most of us, uh, we are not very good at this. For the most part, our society doesn't like silence. I'm guilty of that very often. When I'm here in the office, I will have music playing. Uh, when I'm at home, music is a big part of our home life uh, for Karen and I. And so we will have music playing and uh, normally at least one or two evenings a week. It's just an evening of, of music and we'll be singing together and singing along and adding parts and, and just having a great time. And while that is fantastic, you know what, we are not always good at embracing the silence. We live in a world, don't we, that bombards us with all kinds of sounds. And so I think we get very accustomed to that, to the point where silence perhaps uh, becomes very uncomfortable for many of us. But if we want to get the kind of heavenly wisdom that James describes, we must quiet ourselves so that we can listen to the words of the one voice that speaks with wisdom. We must discipline ourselves to sit down with God's word and to set aside all of the distractions that keep us from hearing him as he speaks to us through his word. We need to turn off the TV. We need to turn off the radio. We need to get away from the computers and the emails. And we need to sit down with scripture and allow God's word to speak to us. God speaks to us through his word. That is the only way we're going to hear his voice. And the only way that we can use the power of one for ultimate good. I think that wisdom also comes from some very unexpected places. Uh, it's quite instructive that wisdom in this passage comes from a place that we would least expect it. It comes from a poor man in a very small town. You see, I think very often we all look for wisdom in the wrong place. Uh, we think if we just read the right book, uh, if we listen to the right seminar, we find the right church. Uh, if we make some other external change, perhaps, uh, life will get better for us. But what we found instead is that wisdom does not just require more information it requires a transformation within us. If I want to be wise, it means that I must change on the inside and not just on the outside. Sometimes God uses things that you and I, quite frankly, just would not 
use. We would not understand. We would not uh, go down this route. But sometimes God does use pain and disease. Sometimes God does use difficulties and trials. Sometimes he uses other people. But usually it's not the people that we may expect him to use. He uses someone that has endured struggles that are similar to ours. He uses that quiet person uh, that never speaks up in a group or comes to us one-on-one. -on -one. Very often he uses a family member or a neighbor or someone right here in this local body. You see, wisdom does not always come from the person who seemingly has all the right answers. We look for that person high and low, and we will, we will search for them. But wisdom does not always come from that person. Very often it comes from the people who we would least expect it to come from, which is why we need to have our spiritual eyes and ears open so that we can take advantage of those opportunities. I remember as a chaplain at Calhoun County Medical Care, uh, when I worked there for a number of years, uh, some of the uh, most theological discussions, some of my greatest joys were being able to sit at the bedside of, of some of the residents that were there and to just listen to the wisdom that they have had and the wisdom that they were just yearning to share. We can learn a lot from one another. And I'm going to say this, God used many of those residents in a mighty way to grow my faith. And uh, I have always, always just been very, very thankful for that. You know, as we look at these things, we need to uh, not have the expectation uh, that the world will embrace godly wisdom. Do not expect the world to embrace the wisdom of God. Uh, verses 15 and 16, it says, there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Even though this poor wise man had saved this small city through the power of one, no one remembered who he was. They didn't remember what he had done. His wisdom was even despised by those around him. In general, the world is not very impressed with godly wisdom. Uh, many times they are downright hostile uh, towards it, and we need to expect that. Back in 2009, uh, the USA uh, Miss America pageant, uh, there was a contestant named Carrie uh, Prejean, and uh, she made this statement as part of her interview. In my country and in my family, I think that I believe that a marriage should be between a man and a woman. No offense to anybody out there, but that is how I was raised and that is how I think it should be uh, between a man and a woman. Um, at that time, uh, as she said that, she was booed uh, by the audience. Uh, she was uh, shunned in the media. She was mocked, she was made fun of. Um, I'll tell you what, uh, she received a lot of backlash for standing up for the principles of what a marriage is supposed to be. She was told that religious beliefs have no place in politics or in the pageant family. You know, um, Carrie was given this incredible platform uh, to share uh, how she felt and how uh, God was leading her uh, in regards to that position. You know, she kind of paid a price for that, okay? Um, 
it did not go well for her uh, from a uh, from a social level. Uh, she really did pay a price. You know, eventually, uh, Carrie was stripped of her title. And it wasn't because of that, but because of something that she had done previously before. Um, and because of that, uh, she was she was stripped of her title. Uh, Carrie uh, Prejean was a prime example, the power of one for good. She shared what she believed, but yet something that had happened in her past kind of destroyed uh, what she had set out to do. Now, I will say this, that, that since that time, uh, she has gone on to do great things. And so when we falter, uh, we, we serve a God and we, we praise a God and we live for a God who forgives us and allows us to go on, who uses us for kingdom work. So you see the power of one for good. We see the power of one uh, that, is, that is not done for good. So here it is, one person, you, me, uh, one person can make a difference, uh, either to advance uh, good or to destroy it. Uh, the difference lies not in our own strength, not in our power, not even in our human wisdom, but rather in whose voice we are listening to. If we listen to the loud demanding voice of this world, if we listen to that voice, it will lead us into sin that will impact not only us, but those that are around us. If we take the time to get quiet, if we take the time to listen to God, and then live our lives according to his wisdom, we can be positive, we can be a a positive influence for good. God calls us to do that. James also goes on to say this, if you don't have wisdom, what are we to do? He says simply this, uh, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Ask for wisdom, especially in this season, uh, so many things that are demanding our attention. Let me encourage you, uh, wisdom, uh, is, is not something for yesterday. Uh, wisdom is something for us right now. I need it, you need it, and I pray that if you don't have it, uh, that you ask God for wisdom and understanding. We invite you to come and to join with us uh, tomorrow on, on Saturday morning, our Sabbath. Uh, we are a Seventh-day Baptist church. Uh, we worship on Saturday. We would invite you to come and join with us as we worship and, and serve together. Uh, our Sabbath school begins at 930, and our time of worship and praise uh, will begin at 1045. If you don't have a church home, we invite you to come and to join with us. Have a great day. God bless you, and we will talk to you soon.